Good morning. <laughs> it's nice to see you in person, and it's nice to know that we have those who are worshiping with us um, remotely. So we, um, we are glad that uh, we're all joined together as the body of Christ, regardless of where we may be. Um, I read somewhere uh, recently that someone was identifying the three major things which hover over our country right now. One was the pandemic, of course, um, which is on everybody's mind, and we think about that um, every day. And second was the economic um, slowdown, which is really connected to the uh, pandemic, and that has affected um, everybody in one way or another. And the third was um, our, our continuing to struggle with our, our racial uh, situation, which um, we have an opportunity, perhaps like n not for a long, that we haven't had for a long time, that we um, uh, have a chance to, um, to address that uh, in, in a positive way. I would add one more to those three, and that is our concern over climate change that we have. Um, you know, when we come here in the sanctuary, we can look out through these beautiful windows and we see um, such a beautiful creation. And it's a reminder to me that we are stewards of the earth that has been entrusted to us. Steward means caretaker. We are the caretakers of, of our earth. So um, welcome. Um, and we, uh, we continue to be together and also to think about these things which are on our national mind these days. I read a um, statement by um, a fellow named K.R. Nost, and he says this, I stand in prayerful support, calling people to speak out about and follow Jesus' way of love, seeking to be a people of peace and advocates of justice to a nation that continues to be wounded by racism, experiencing anger, and in profound grief. And then he has this, he ends on this hopeful note. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. All things break, and all things can be mended. Not with time, as they say, but with intention. So go and love intentionally, extravagantly, unconditionally. The broken world awaits in darkness for the light that is you. Um, we... Um, are, are reminded that, you, and, and you, you have done a, you've done a good job of wearing your mask in, in the building. And I, you know, I have mine. I've, I wear it until I come up here in the pulpit, and I'm at least 20 feet away from, uh, from you. So um, that gives you some, um, s some protection. But we, um, I remind you that we are to wear our mask before entering the, the building, and then. Un and to keep it on until we exit the building. I um, also remind you after the service that you should leave the building. You should not uh, linger in the hallway. Um, you should go out into the parking lot if you want to visit for a, a little bit. Um, I, you know, we, we don't get to be, uh, we don't get to, to relate and interact the way that we used to or the way that we will be able to in the future. Um, I feel concern about that because I think sometimes you, um, you may want to be in touch with me. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask Judy, um, our wonderful, wonderful um, office manager, I'm going to ask her next week to print in the bulletin my email address and my telephone number so that if you need me, I am always available that way. Or I have gotten some notes from people that have uh, been um, very heartening that I've, I've appreciated. So we can stay in touch even though we, um, we can't do it um, in person right now. Um, there is a... Um, an Episcopal uh, clergywoman who lives in Massachusetts. Her name is 
Emily Garcia, and she gives us this prayer for masks. And I will um, just relate this to you as a way to, um, to lead us, uh, to, to continue to lead us into our worship service. We bless you and we praise you, Lord Christ, for commanding us to love one another. Let this mask be a sign of your love and let my behavior be filled with love for my neighbor. Amen. I think that's a good prayer to pray uh, as we uh, use our masks each day. Now, as you are able, would you uh, stand and let's join together in our call to worship. <laughs> Welcome to this faith community. Welcome to this time of worship and reflection. As we are blessed by the work we do and the relationships we have and the locations where we spend our time, may we be blessed in this time and place. Let's continue in prayer together. O oh God, you who are all-powerful and all-knowing, you who know where we have come from and where we are going, even though we do not know these things about ourselves, we thank you that you are God all by yourself and that there is no problem so big that you cannot handle. Therefore, God, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you today and to bring to you the concerns of our hearts knowing that you can and will solve them in a way that exceeds our limited understanding or expectation. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's sing together. Wolfgang. Please be seated. We come together flawed, unfinished, damaged, disobedient. Let us confess our fallen state before God and each other. Let us pray together. We realize that we have fallen short of your glory. Hear our prayers of confession. We have heard your cry for justice but we have used the excuse that we are only one voice among many. We have heard your cry for protecting the earth, but we have used the excuse that science will find a way to save our planet. We have heard your cry for reconciliation with our brothers and sisters, 
but we have used the excuse that we do not know many of those who are of another race or culture. We have heard your cry to help the poor and homeless, but we have used the excuse that they will misuse the help. We have run out of simple excuses and now must face our own sinfulness. Forgive us, O oh Lord, and move us to action. Let us pray in silence. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves his love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. And now we stand and join in the ritual of friendship. May the grace of the risen Lord be with you all. Greet one another from your seat with signs of love and reconciliation. <laughs> And now if you'll be seated, we will invite uh, Becky Dean McGinnis to come and sing for us.
But whether there be prophecy, they shall fail. And whether there be tongues, they shall cease. And whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. of these is love. Will you join me in the prayer for illumination as uh, printed in your bulletin? Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear what you say to us today. Now, the selection today is from the Old Testament. It's from the book of Exodus. We, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we took um, a look at some of the um, Ten Commandments in relationship to um, something else that, that we were doing that day. Um, and I said that we would take a closer look at them um, in the future. And lo and behold, the future is here. Today's the day. <laughs> so um, we're using uh, this um, selection from Exodus. The, the uh, Ten Commandments are actually found two places in the Old Testament. One is in the book of Exodus and the other is in the book of Deuteronomy. We're using um, the passage in Exodus. The setting, of course, is after the children of Israel have been freed from 400 years of slavery and bondage in Egypt. And Moses, under the guidance and direction of God, has led them through the sea into the desert, the Sinai Desert, and they're going to now spend 40 years traveling around, wandering around in the desert. And where they are eventually headed for is the promised land of Canaan, which is also called Palestine, and now we call it Israel. If you, were, if you look at a map, and some, some Bibles uh, do include maps, but if you look at a map at the wanderings of the children of Israel, you will see that it overlaps and it goes back and it twists around. And you wonder why they just couldn't have gone directly from Egypt into Canaan. I mean, it seems like it certainly wouldn't have taken 40 years. Well, some people say that it's because um, Moses was male and did not wish to stop and ask for directions. I really wouldn't be prepared to offer any insight into that, but nevertheless, there are some very good reasons that they also profited by being in the desert for that long period of time. All of the generations who came from Egypt, who knew nothing but slavery and bondage, they have all passed away now. And a new generation that was psychologically and spiritually ready to inherit the promised land. That's one good reason. Another was that they needed to have an opportunity to hone their identity as a people, because when they came out of Egypt, they were really just a, just a collection of slaves of a certain ethnic group. But after 40 years, it gave them an opportunity to understand themselves as a nation, as a people set apart. 
And so they needed that time in order to, to be able to hone that identity as a nation. And in the midst of their wanderings, they were not only recently out of slavery and bondage, but they were not only working on their identity as a people, but they also were without any direction. They seemed to not understand what it was that God required of them, both to be in relationship to God and also to be in relationship with each other. And so at one point in their wanderings, God calls Moses apart up into Mount Sinai and he gives to them a, an ethic. He gives to Moses to give to the people an ethical system, which we call the Ten Commandments. Now notice that it is called the Ten Commandments. It does not say the Ten Suggestions or Ten Options. They are called the Ten Commandments. And the purpose of this was really a gift. It was not simply to superimpose on the Israeli, on, on the Israelites an arbitrary set of rules. It was a gift. This is what I expect of you, God says. And this is how you can live in relationship with me and how you can live in relationship with each other. And if you follow these, life will, will go well. We can live in peace. So it was really given as a gift. And it was delivered to Moses on the top of Mount Sinai and then brought down to the people. Now let's hear this together. I'm reading Exodus 20, starting with verse 1, going through verse 17, and I'm using the New Revised Standard Version. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the, the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter or your male and female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What was the number one rule in your house when you were growing up? Or what is the number one rule in your house right now? I asked um, some worshipers one time what the number one rule was in their house, and I got a whole variety of answers. But only a couple of them had to do with um, moral direction. They were things like, keep your voice down, don't chew with your mouth open, and I, uh, in, in my own household growing up, I remember the primary rule was, don't you do anything to bring disgrace to this family. <laughs> oh, some of you had that same rule, huh? <laughs> um, there was a fellow one time who told me that one of the primary rules in his house was, don't cuss. 
And that reminded me of a time in my childhood. I was actually in junior high by that time. My parents had brought, bought for me the pride of my life. Speaking of making things an idol, <laughs> it was a camel's hair coat. It actually wasn't really camel's hair, but it was that same color. And I called it a camel's hair coat. I love that coat. It was along about April and the spring rains had come and everything was muddy and wet outside and I was walking home from junior high with my new coat on. The neighbors had a dog, a boxer, and he was exceedingly friendly and it, he was accustomed to greeting anyone who came along his sidewalk. And when he saw me, he came up to me with his muddy paws and he put him right on the front of my coat. Well, I was mad, and the more I tried to shift around and wiggle around and push him down, the more he'd get down on the ground and get a new supply of mud, and then up he'd come. I had muddy paw prints on my front, and I had them on the back. I was mad as a hornet. I was furious. And as I went into the house, I thought nobody was there. My preacher father, I assumed, was down at the church in his study there. My mother was rarely home on um, a weekday afternoons. And so I went in the door thinking that the house was empty. And I uttered an oath against that dog that no junior high school girl should know the words to. <laughs> and then there came the sound of footsteps upstairs. And my father appeared in the landing, and he said, Patricia Ann, come up to my office. Well, I'll not tell you the rest of the story, but believe me, it was not pretty. <laughs> Don't cuss. I guess that was a rule in our house, although it was not spoken of exactly. And you know, every household has got rules. And we have got these rules so that we know what the expectations are for the people who live in the house, how we, how we can get along together. They're, they're organized, even if it's informally. They're, they're not arbitra arbitrary. They're organized and transmitted to us and to the children so that they know what the expectations are, how we live with each other. And so it is with the household of faith. And brothers and sisters, we are the household of faith. 3,000 years ago, give or take a year or two, God gave the household of faith a set of rules, an ethical system, a blueprint for living, not just to make us arbitrarily follow them, but in order that life might be good, in order that we might live in peace with one another in order that we might know what God expects from us. And we call them the Ten Commandments. I mentioned this to you a couple of weeks ago, but USA Today had a, a poll several years ago about the Ten Commandments, and they asked an arbitrarily chosen group of people, as they often do when they take a sample poll, and they asked how many people thought that the Ten Commandments were a good idea. Well, almost everybody did. 95% of the people said, yeah, they thought the Ten Commandments were a good idea and that everybody ought to live by them. And then they were asked if they could name them. Well, hardly anybody could name them. But there were many people who were able to name one of them. I mentioned this to you a couple of weeks ago. Do you remember what I told you that one was? Thou shalt not commit adultery. It seems everybody knows that that was part of the Ten Commandments. So it's really the obligation of the church to periodically bring these before us so that we might be in touch with this ancient ethical, ethical system that has brought peace and good living to countless people. The f let's look at them in a little more detail. The first four really deal with our relationship with God, and they are sketched out in much more detail than the subsequent ones that follow. Um, commandment one is found in chapter one, verse three. You shall have no other gods before me. God was telling the people of Israel as 
us as the people who follow, that there is nothing which is to be of any more primary importance in our lives than our relationship with God. And for those of us who are Christian, we understand that relationship to be formed and to be understood through Jesus Christ. But there is nothing which is to interfere with that relationship. It is the ultimate reality for those of us who are people of faith. Nothing shall interfere with that relationship with God. And it's not accidental that that was placed as number one. If we are able to place that first commandment as in the number one position in our lives, then all the rest will follow. Later, almost a thousand years later, in the first century, which is the era of Jesus Christ, by that time there were not just Ten Commandments. The Jewish law had evolved until now there were 613 various parts of the Torah, of the law. And the people who wanted to trip Jesus up, who wanted to ask him kind of a trip question, said to him, Oh, Rabbi, what do you think? Which of these 613 do you think is the most important law? And Jesus said this, if you love God and love your neighbor, then all the rest will fall in place. The summary of the entire law and the intent of the law is love God first and then love your neighbor as you love yourself. And you remember from other times when we have talked about the teachings of Jesus, the summary of the law, love God and love your neighbor. So, the first one in Exodus 20, verse 3, is you shall have no other gods before me. God comes first. And the second one in verse 4 is, do not make for yourself an idol. In the time when the Ten Commandments were first transmitted, all the neighbors of Israel had idols, visual representations of the gods and goddesses whom they worshipped. And so when God says, you shall not make or worship uh, any idols, he was really setting them apart from the normative religious expression of that time. He was setting them apart. In Egypt, of course, there were many idols, many gods and goddesses whom they were exposed to in their, their long time in Egypt. But God said to them, you are not to make any idols. You are not to worship any idols. Now, not many of us have graven images in our homes that we consider to be holy, but we have our idols, and some of them are more subtle and more far-reaching than a junior high girl's love for her camel hair coat. Many of them are encouraged by our culture, and they are subtle. For example, some of us are preoccupied with our financial statements. Some of us are overly concerned about our positions within the family or perhaps in the, our community. Some of us make idols of power and influence. Some of us make idols of our youth and of our material possessions. They are subtle. They creep up on us. But God is saying to us, as surely as God said to the children of Israel, you are to have no idols in your life. The third one is contained in verse, in verse 7. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God. In other words, we are not to use God's name in a disrespectful way. We are not to use God's name for profanity. We are not to use it casually. But we are to understand that the name of God is holy. And that's something that's increasingly difficult for us to do in our time and culture because the name of Jesus Christ is used casually. The name of God is used profanely. But God is saying that it's important not only to honor God's name, but it is for our own spiritual well-being that we use the name of God appropriately and with respect. The next one is found in verse 8. 
Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Isn't it interesting that one-tenth of this ethical system, one-tenth is devoted to the holiness of the Sabbath? You know, God is so smart. God knows all about us, and he knows that we human beings require what, what we require, and he even modeled it for us. In the act of creation, he creates for, for six days, and on the seventh day, he does what? He takes the day off. He rests. And the Hebrew people observe Sabbath, and the Jewish people still do today. It is from sundown sat uh, Friday to sundown on Saturday, and they, then they are to do the things which bring honor and glory to God and health and wholeness to the individual. They are to worship. They are to set aside their normal activities. They are to spend quality time with family and with friends and to nurture relationships. Now, maybe you and I are not able to spend the Lord's Day exactly like that, but somewhere, somewhere in our week, we are to carve out a little space for ourselves, which we call Sabbath, a time to rest. God says that rest is holy. Listen to that again. God says rest is holy. You see, our, our culture does not say that at all. Our culture says if you are not producing, if you are not busy, then you're not worth anything. How many times have you heard somebody say almost in a boasting way, well, I'm just so busy. I just don't have a moment to myself. God says that being productive is, is holy, but that rest is also holy, and that that rhythm of rest and work is important. So our Sabbath is a time set apart. It's a time for the cessation of our normal activities. It's a time to be spent in prayer, in meditation, in the reading of devotional materials, in the reading of the Bible. It's a time to be spent with our significant relationships. A holy time, a time set apart to honor God. Maybe it can only be an hour for you. Maybe it's the hour when you come to worship together. Maybe it can be just a couple of hours. Maybe it's a half a day. It may not be on the Sabbath or on what we call the Lord's Day. You see, our Sabbath has, we refer to it as the Lord's Day because that was the day of resurrection. Perhaps it won't be on those days, but somewhere in your week, we are commanded to take some time apart. The first four of these have to do with our relationship with God. And the rest of them are straightforward behavioral patterns of how we treat one another. Honor your father and mother. Not only your biological father and mother, but, but others in your constellation of family and friends who are elderly. Honor the elderly. Here again, our culture does not encourage that. But God says, honor the elderly. Number 13 says, you shall not murder. If the society is to hold together, we need to count on each other not to harm one another, not to take one another's lives. Do not commit adultery. I can think of nothing that disrupts a marital relationship or a family so deeply, so painfully, so drastically as the infidelity of one of the partners. So God tells us for our own good, we are to remain faithful to our marriage vows. Verse 15 says, you shall not steal. We need to be able to count on each other not to steal one, another, not one another's belongings, but not only one another's belongings, but other things that are valuable to us, other things like our reputation. We can steal reputations. We can steal, we can make such an idol of our work that we steal time away from our families and our significant relationships. So we are not to steal in any form. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. We are to love the truth. We are not to tell things that are untrue. 
If we cannot trust one another to tell the truth within our households, the household begins to disintegrate. If we cannot trust one another to tell the truth in our workplace, then the workplace is unsettled. If we can't trust one another to tell the truth in our relationships, then those relationships are not solid. Verse 17 says, you shall not covet. You shall not envy. You shall not be jealous of anything that belongs to somebody else. Now, brothers and sisters, the, tr the reality is there's not a one of us who has not envied or experienced jealousy at some point. It's just part of the human experience. It's part of what it means to be human. But we know the other side of that, which is how it eats away at our spirits when we are jealous, when we are envious. And God says, for our own benefit, don't do it. Be content with what you have. Be content with who you are. 3,000 years old, and it stood the test of time. Wise people still follow it. Many legal systems of other countries are based on it. Of the 10 that we have looked at today, which of these do you think our nation most needs to hear? Of the 10 that we've looked at today, which one do you personally need to hear? Will you pray with me? We thank you, Lord God, that you have not left us without some indication of what your expectations are for us. We thank you that in this system of ethics, you have helped us to know how to live with you and with each other. And we pray that as we continue through our lives, as we identify the one that we most need to hear today, that we may not only hear it, but that we may be doers of the word as well. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, stand as you're able, and let's join together in our offertory prayer. We do not pass the offering plates among ourselves now, but they are located at the, um, uh, at, uh, at the opening of the sanctuary, and you're invited to leave your tithes and offerings there. But we do dedicate them together with this offertory prayer. Let us pray. The offerings we bring, O oh God, are a response to your love. Your provision for us is constant. Your faithfulness is never ending. Your love continually breaks through to us. May our giving be worthy in your sight. May our whole lives be a response to you. For the sake of our Lord Jesus. Amen. And will you remain standing as we, um, as we uh, join together in the affirmation of faith? We are using the Apostles' Creed, the traditional form. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Will you be seated, please? And let us continue together in prayer. Oh, Lord God, how are we ever going to be your disciples? We are overwhelmed by the needs of the world. The cries of people who feel threatened by others, those who are in need, those who are in danger, those who are alienated, those cries ring in our ears and in our hearts. 
Sometimes we would just like to run and hide, hoping that all this turmoil will just go away. But it doesn't. It sits outside our doors and waits for us to do something. Lord, help that something to be service and compassion. Help us to remember how you have forgiven and blessed each one of us and how you have called us blessed and beloved. You remind us in today's scripture of what is expected of us, of how to live with one another. And now is the time for us to take that to heart. We are called to reach beyond our comfort zone. And that is difficult for us to do. And so we need to feel your powerful presence with us. Bless us again, O Lord, with a good measure of courage and strength that we may truly serve you. Now bless those whose names and situations we bring before you in our hearts today for healing and hope. In your mercy and love, help us to reach out to others as you, as you have reached out to us. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will you stand now to receive the benediction and the blessing? And I remind you after, after uh, this that you will be seated again. We will hear um, Amy's postlude, and then you will be dismissed from the back row by row. I remind you not to linger in the hallway, but to move out to the parking lot. Brothers and sisters, we have been called to, um, to serve in love and compassion with each other. We have called, been called to take care of one another. May this week be filled with opportunities for you to respond with, with courage and compassion in ways large and small, and may it all be to the honor and glory of our Lord Jesus. And now may the God who has created each of us and the Christ who came that we might have life and have it abundantly, and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, may it rest and abide with each of us today and always. Go in peace, and may God bless you.